Gratitude and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness explores assisting those in grief, the gratitude that keeps us connected, and the greatness we achieve in helping our community heal. I'm your host, Sarah Shaul. David Walker overcame the early loss of his father and activated his love of comics to become a successful comic book writer, filmmaker, and publisher. I speak with David about his experiences with grief and how it has informed his storytelling. I always wanted to work in the comic industry ever since I was a little kid. And I got sidetracked by a whole lot of other things, but I never totally went away from it. I worked at a newspaper for many years. And before that, I had jobs like working in warehouses and things like that. But I always wanted to go into comics. I'd say I had maybe one foot in the industry for a long time, or maybe just, you know, two or three toes. And then as I was getting closer to my 40th birthday, having for lack of a better term, that midlife crisis or the existential crisis that comes as you're about to turn 40, I realized I hadn't really done this thing that I wanted to do since I was a little kid. And that if I didn't try now, it was just going to be harder. If it was difficult as I was getting closer to 40, how difficult was it going to be as I was getting closer to 50 or as I was getting closer to 60? All of this was coupled with the advice that was given to me by a man named Will Eisner, And Will Eisner is arguably the greatest comic book creator of all time. I interviewed him when I was still working at a newspaper as a journalist, talking to one of his childhood heroes, someone that I wanted to be when I grew up. Comics I'd pretty much given up as a realistic life goal. After the interview, Will told me, he said, wow, you know a lot about comics. And I said, well, you know, this is something I wanted to do, but I gave up. He was like, why'd you give up? And I said, it just didn't work out. And he said, it's never too late. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm not getting any younger. At this point, I was in my 30s and he was in his 80s and he was still working, right? Yeah. He looked at me and he said, really, you're going to tell me about not getting any younger? (laughs) And that really lit the spark. And so a few years later, I just started pushing a little harder and Will Eisner passed away, but those words were still burning in my brain. And I was like, you know, you got to try. The worst that can happen is it doesn't work out, but you haven't given it 100%. Most of us don't give anything 100%. I think most of us on an average day probably give it like 25, 30%, you know? And I was like, just give it 100% for a while. See where it gets you. If I had one foot in the door, now I had both feet in the door. I was even in the room. And I thought, you know, what's a project that could really help solidify my place? Shaft was, that was it. It's a long, boring story, but uh, but I made it happen. That's the thing. That concept of being a storyteller really hit me somewhere within, we'll say, the last 10 to 15 years. I was hung up on specific types of writing or specific descriptions for what I was doing and not thinking about the complexity of what storytelling can be. And I think somebody said to me, well, man, you've worn a lot of different hats. And I was like, no, not really. What do you mean? Not really. You've done this. You've done that. And I said, yeah, but it's all just telling stories. And that was when I realized, oh, yeah, okay, this is what you are. Then when I look back on my life, I was that kid in third grade, second grade, who would show up to school on Monday and tell all the other kids about the movie that I saw over the weekend. Because I went to the movies a lot as a kid. I would essentially act out the movie, you know, on the playground or in the cafeteria and recreate it as best I could. Even that in and of itself is a form of storytelling. Oh, yeah. I spent many years working as a critic, mostly film critic, but I also wrote about other things. And even that is a form of storytelling because part of what you're talking about is your experience having watched this other thing. I just told my friend's son the other day, he's 14, and we were just talking about movies, and he was telling me about his favorite movies. And I said to him, when you're really talking about your favorite movies, it's not just a movie that you love. It's who you saw that movie with, where you were when you saw that movie, all these things that can go into it. And he looked at me and he was like, I never thought about it that way. I got to see Kurt Vonnegut Mm -hmm. when I was in college talking about writing and 
And he said, this book, every time someone picks this up and every time someone reads it, it's a different book. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. because everyone brings their own experience to it. Even if that individual picks up this book a second time or third time, it's a new book. It's every a different single time. book every single time because maybe you read that book the first time when you were 20. The second time you read it, you're 40. You're married or maybe you've married and divorced. Maybe you've got kids. It's kind of amazing how differently these things manifest within ourselves. The things that we experience, film, books, music. When I was a kid growing up, I loved the Beatles. I still love the Beatles. Man, Beatles songs are a lot different. They mean something different when you're 50 than when you're 16. All those love songs, you know, you'd make these mixtapes and you'd give it to somebody that you really liked in high school or whatever. But all of those songs, they mean something very, very different. Or they should mean something different as we get older. I mentor this young man. He says he wants to be a writer. I would argue that he already is. But he was talking about his fear of putting something out there and people hating it. And I said to him, you know, once you create it and put it out there, it's not yours anymore. You share it with every single person. I don't care if it's a book. I don't care if it's a song. It could be a painting. I read a Kurt Vonnegut book. It's now in part mine. I've internalized it. It means something different to me than it means to anybody else. We could agree on 99 out of 100 things what this book means or what this movie means, but it's that one out of 100 thing that makes it slightly different for me than it would for you. Because you're bringing your experience yeah. to the reading of that book. Your experience, your imagination. For me, anyway, it's even more true with music, in part because not everybody listens to music the same way. There's some people who never pay attention to the lyrics. I always listen to the lyrics of songs. You know, what does that mean? When Chris Cornell says he's looking California, but feeling Minnesota, what does that mean? What does that mean to me? What does that say about him? What does he think of Minnesota? What does he think of Cal? I'm nuts that way. So I'm, and I still am, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. The meaning of our experience in our culture mm -hmm. today and the work that you do, mostly you write comics. Right now, anyway. <laughs> you wrote a graphic novel of Frederick Douglass. The Life of Frederick Douglass, yes. Where did that come in your timeline of storytelling? Relatively recently, the book came out in January 2019. Did the research and the writing in 2017. Then the artist took over, worked on it throughout a good chunk of 2017, 2018. In the timeline of David F. Walker, it's fairly recently. And it also represents not a major shift, but a significant shift of the sort of writing I do, especially within the medium of comics, doing stuff that's more nonfiction, historical based, something that I thought about doing for a long time, but the opportunity never presented itself. 10 Speed Press, when he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I'm a fan of your work. This is something we're thinking about doing. Would you be interested? And I was like, oh, I've always thought about doing nonfiction, never thought about doing the life of Frederick Douglass. But you know what? Here's the opportunity to do it. Either I'm going to love it or I'm going to hate it, but you're never going to know till you try. We had started to touch on this idea of telling stories in a culture that has a very limited narrative line. Mm -hmm. You know, like myself being a first generation American Jew. I mean, I wasn't even a Jew like the other Jews. I wasn't like, <laughs> I wasn't an Ashkenazi, you know, I was, I didn't even belong with those guys, you yeah, know, because yeah. I was this Sephardic Jew. I mean, we ate rice at Passover. How dare I you? know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> because that's what the Middle Eastern Jews did. I think slowly inside of me, I experienced this resentment that I was forced to adhere to and acknowledge the prevalent culture. I think at first I was like, I don't understand why we only have these Christian holidays off. That's what we do. This is what we acknowledge and mm -hmm. this is what we do. I get what you're saying because, you know, my mom's Jewish. So I was, okay, how come we only have these holidays off, only the Christian holidays off, right. that they didn't celebrate the Jewish holidays. So it was just right. like they were angry right. that they didn't, you know, my mom and her siblings would sort of joke about this, like, OK, well, we didn't get Christmas, but then we also didn't really get Hanukkah or anything else. And so they were a very holiday light, holiday deficient family. I was in my own way cognizant of that before I moved to Portland, grew up in a small town in Connecticut where there weren't a lot of Jewish families at the school I went to. There was like three. And, and he knew it because everybody kind of picked on them. How come you're not celebrating Christmas? And 
I actually developed a resentment for Christmas because of the way the Jewish kids in my school were treated for not celebrating Christmas. How's that for weird, right? There's one family who every year they did a presentation on the history of Hanukkah for the entire school. So I know more about the history of Hanukkah than I do about the history of Christmas. Years later, I tracked down this guy through Facebook. I said, yeah, you know, your parents did this every year. I just wanted to thank you guys Mm -hmm. because it gave me a greater appreciation. I understand the tradition. I don't understand why we put up a Christmas tree. I really don't, you know, but I understand the menorah. I understand the lighting of it. But that storytelling, you know, you're talking about your parents immigrating to the U.S. Everybody has a story. Every culture has a story, every family and every town. And and it's the, the choice of the words that we use to tell it. Thank you for listening in to this episode of Grief, Gratitude and Greatness. We appreciate you following the work we do and would love it if you'd share us with your friends and family. Your recommendation helps us reach more ears and build upon the work we're doing. There's multiple levels of grief that informs the work that I do. The work that I do for people who are never going to get to see it. And by that, there's very specific people. My dad being one, my grandparents, and I have two other friends who died really young. It's this handful of people that were really crucial in my life and my development. It's almost like I'm creating to impress them. Mm -hmm. And when you're creating to impress dead folks... What does that say about you? What does that say about your work? Do you write extra hard hoping that if there is an afterlife that they can see it from that afterlife? You also have to find peace within yourself that, yeah, your dad's never going to see this. Is your dad going to be proud of the man that you've become? I don't know. And more importantly, how much do I have to care? If I let that totally dictate my work, then I'm going to fail. But it's almost like because I can't ever achieve it, it's almost like the carrot in front of the horse. It's like this carrot dangling. I keep chasing after it. And I think about what would my grandmother say about this? And, you know, she died in March of 1985. So mm-hmm. she's been gone a long time. Everything I do, everything I do for her. Is that healthy? Is that unhealthy? I don't know. She died, you know, I was, I was like 16, I think. There was nobody in my life who taught me more about just being myself and just going for it. And so I'm writing for her. I'm writing to honor her. But there's also this part of me that's, you know, really, really sad that she doesn't get to see it. And then there's this part of me that's like, well, if there is some semblance of afterlife, if there is something beyond all of this, not to say that I necessarily do believe, but you leave just enough room that maybe I'll see her again someday. You know, maybe she'll actually say, hey, I read that Shaft book. You know, hey, baby, I read that Shaft book. You used a lot of bad words, but... um. <laughs> But that's okay, you know. I write for a lot of ghosts, I guess. Again, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing. It works for me most of the time. There's sometimes where there's a bit of melancholy that sets in. I have a really good friend, Paul, who passed away in 2012. Half the time we didn't agree on anything. We fought. I hated going to the movies with him because he talked so loud during the movies, right? He's one of those loud talkers. But there's always an interesting conversation to be had after the fact. And he was someone that I would chop things up with. I'd go, hey, I'm working on this story. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Now I will say, what would Paul say? What's the advice he would give me? And of course, then that sort of makes me sad, you know, for sure. Sometimes monumentally sad. But then it also reinforces the importance of asking those questions. Paul, even when we disagreed, made me a better writer. Made me a more critical thinker. And so, yeah, sometimes it's painful to think about him. It's heartbreaking. But by thinking about him, by bringing that pain into the process, it produces, I think, better work. Yeah. Maybe it's not you thinking about them not getting to see the finished product. Maybe it's really thinking about how they would perceive it or how they would appreciate it. It's you acknowledging the gifts that they gave you to be able to write it. That's it. You know, things don't always work out the way we want, the way we planned. Isn't that life? I think for the most part, life is things didn't work out the way we imagined. How do you deal with it? How do you make lemonade out of lemons? And you ain't even got lemons to make lemonade. So you're actually making limeade. What do you do with what you have? You know, life isn't fair and this isn't how it was supposed to be. Yeah, well, maybe it isn't how it's supposed to be, but this is how it is. At what point do we cease 
living in the world as we want it to be and start living in the world the way it is while simultaneously working to change it. You had shared something with me. You had said something like, this is what happens when you've been raised by grief. Before I moved to Portland, I grew up in Connecticut, right outside New York City, a small, tiny little town. We went to the cemetery a lot. My dad died when I was a year and a half old, so I don't even have any memories of my father. His older brother died a few years after that. I was about five when my Uncle Mark died. So we went to the, the cemetery a lot. And as a kid, you know, cemeteries scared me. They kind of freaked me out. But then over the years, my other uncle died. My grandparents died. My grandparents' siblings died. And a lot of the family is buried in this one cemetery. So I go home to Connecticut to visit those that are still left alive, probably back there once every year or so. And I always go to the cemetery. And I realized, this was within the last four or five years, I realized that that's more my home than the home I grew up in. There's two houses I grew up in. One is my grandparents' house, which is still there, but it's it's falling apart. The house that I actually grew up in down the street, I haven't even set foot in that house in over 30 years. Most of what I remember of home is gone, except for the cemetery. This place that terrified me as a kid now brings me peace. When your dad is dead before your second birthday and going to see dad means going to the cemetery, you know, when his name comes up in a conversation, people either get really quiet or they start to cry. And then to have his brother die a few years later, I was constantly in an environment where people were grieving. Neither of them lived to be 30, neither my dad nor my uncle. And then my dad's youngest brother died before he was 50. And then all the cousins, my dad's cousins, he had a lot of cousins. I've outlived everybody, that whole generation the baby boomer generation. At this point, I've outlived all of them. I've lived to be older than all of them were. Maybe say, oh, I was raised by grief is a little bit too poetic or, you know, Sylvia Plath-like or something. I don't know. But, But it was always there. It was sort of lingering in the air. It also makes you profoundly aware of how short life can be. When you're, say, five or six years old and your uncle dies and you go to the funeral that's one thing. It's, you know, the, the adults in your life are trying to explain to you what it means when someone has died. But then you hit a point where you've outlived him. Yeah. And then you really begin to realize, oh, this is short. You know, this, he didn't live very long. Your dad didn't live very long. When my grandfather passed away, he was into his 80s. 80 don't seem that far now. You know, once you hit like 40, 50, suddenly 80 just does not seem nearly as old. And once you hit 40 or 50, you also realize how young 25 or 30 is. I see a lot of people try to sugarcoat what it means when somebody dies. There wasn't a lot of that. The one thing my family did do, they did it mostly with my dad and my uncle, because again, both of them are so young, they stopped talking about them. Mm. And that, I think, has informed a lot of how I am as I get older and as I've gotten older, which is I'll talk about anybody, whatever mystery that surrounds my dad comes from the fact that the pain of losing him and, and my uncle so young that the family just kind of shut down and almost made it so that they didn't exist. And then by the time I was old enough to really comprehend what had happened, most of the people that talked to about this stuff had died. You know, my yeah. grandmother was gone. I, I don't know if my grandmother ever would have been able to talk about it. You know, you, you're talking to a relative in their 70s or 80s and the pain is still there, right? I started thinking at some point, like, we have to take the pain out of this because otherwise you have these generations where, where it's all lost. You right. know, if, if we can't talk about even the most painful things, which, you know, the most painful things usually involve someone dying or tragic things that have happened, like the pain is just as real. All the stuff is just as real. This is very crucial. This is sort of my philosophy in life. If after somebody dies, we stop talking about them because it's too painful of a memory because they've died, then it means that the death has won. Mm. Life hasn't won. The life of this person, their accomplishments sort of go away because the pain of it. And yeah, there's pain. But at some point we have to, I wouldn't say move beyond the pain because I don't believe there's moving beyond it. Right. But what you do is you find this parallel path. My best friend died 2011. So we're talking eight years ago. 
I watched it devastate all of us and everybody, like so many people stopped talking about him. And I was like, what are you doing? This is not honoring him in any capacity. Are we going to be this selfish? Not only this selfish, but also we're going to let that, the pain and the heartbreak, we're going to let it win. <laughs> you know, it should only win if you're writing a song about pain and heartbreak. <laughs> And I'm not into those that much anymore. We all go through that phase where every great song is about pain and heartbreak. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to listen to those anymore. I, I only want to listen to songs that put a smile on my face, not bring a tear to my eye, because life will bring the tears for sure. So you're asking, how can I support the awesome work that's happening on the Grief, Gratitude and Greatness podcast? Become a backer on Patreon. Your support allows us to deliver conversations that help to dissolve the stigma and evolve our culture around grief. You'll find a link to contribute via Patreon in the show notes. And if you have something valuable to offer our listeners, let's talk. We'd love to invite you to sponsor the show. I mean, a lot of people use art to honor those who've gone. Yep. So when you talk about a song about pain and loss, I mean, in some ways that's talking about somebody who's gone, yes. right? That's, yes, a, that's a way, that's a, that's a conduit for some people. The challenge is how do we acknowledge that pain? How do we talk about these mm -hmm. people who are gone or these painful situations? Not letting death win, I, yeah. as you say, but how do we do that? and keep that person's essence going. How do we do that? And then also at the same time, not give in to that pain. It's not easy. It's definitely not an easy thing. And, and I think it's okay if you give in for a little while. You know, sometimes I, you just don't want to talk about it. Sometimes, yeah, my dad was like 22 when he died. Mm. You know, I wasn't even a year and a half old. He, you know, they, my mom and dad had me really young and my dad lived a reckless life and he died young and nobody ever talked about him, ever, to the extent that here it is 40 something years later and I'm still chasing that one. You know, I'm still trying to figure him out. I'm still trying to learn right. about him. And now there's not that many people left. I got a, a message the other day from somebody who must have seen a post that I'd put somewhere and was like, hey, are you related to this person and this person, I was like, yeah, well, that was my dad and that was my uncle. And I didn't ask. I didn't say, hey, do you have any good stories? Mm -hmm. I stopped asking because the one thing I couldn't handle was hearing the same three, four stories that everybody tells about my both my dad and my uncle. And I was like, okay, this must be the things that people glommed onto that was easier. They were okay. Yeah, that was easy to process. Whatever it was, you know, my dad played little league baseball. Everybody always talks about him playing baseball. And, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. Let me guess. He was really good at baseball. How do I know that? You know, because I played little league baseball in an attempt just to be like my dad, because that was the only connection when I was a kid that people said. Now I'm a middle-aged man. There's these people that are in their 70s they're reaching out to me on Facebook. And whenever they have a story, it's almost like they all got together when my dad died. It's an easy memory. It's a good memory. Part of me is like, yeah, I'd like to know some of the bad stuff my dad did. Maybe that will help me understand him more. As a complex individual, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, right? because we are all complex. How do we honor the dead? We, we remember them in their complexity. Most of the historical figures that we know, we don't know them. We know the myth of who they are, right? And at some point, that's all any of us become is the myth of who we were. I'd like my myth to have a little bit more complexity. And I think everybody's myth should be a little bit more complex. But a lot of us just try to even simplify who we are. And boy, that, that, does that ever get you into trouble, you know? And how uh, does simplifying who you are get you into trouble? It's not acknowledging all of the bad things that have happened, either happened to us or that we've done. It's not taking responsibility because we've all said and done hurtful things. We've all been hurt and we've all done the hurting. It's easy to throw blame on another party. But I think that the hard part is owning some of it. How do we tell the story of ourselves, our involvement, our complicity within our own lives? Your family's shutting down. Is it just too painful to change the narrative from their promise of what their future could be? Nobody knows anyone 100%. My grandfather 
when he died, I was very close to my grandfather. But there's so much stuff about him I don't even know. Because here's a guy who was probably 60 years older than me. So he had 60 years of life before I came into the planet. I think about a lot of this stuff. How well do we know any one person? There's this notion, well, the moment you discover it, it's real. Van Halen's album 1984 didn't exist until you heard it for the first time, (laughs) right? Most of us only know little bits and pieces of, of anybody's story. Do you ever think of creating your own narrative for your dad? I'm actually, it's a project that I'm working on right now. And it's not so much a narrative for my dad, but it's a story about trying to create that narrative. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to some of the work that I've done in the past, working with young people, helping them create narratives for somebody they've lost, whether it's a parent or a sibling or someone close to them. It got me to thinking about, well, I need to do this for my own self. And it seems very daunting It is my dad, and it's someone who I'm so far removed from in terms of not really knowing them, and yet, like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. How do we wrap our heads around that? It'd be so much easier for me to write something about or to create something about a good friend or even, you know, my grandfather who, uh, you know, he's been gone for coming up on 15 years. You know, my grandfather, we, we got a lot of history together. There's a lot of experiences So in that regard, as a storyteller, there ain't much challenge to that. The real challenge is for my dad. In a lot of grief therapy, grief counseling, a lot of times they'll say to you, if you just could have one more conversation with this person, you know, if you could have just one more hour with them, what would you say? What would you do? And I had a friend ask me that in sort of a non-therapeutic way, more like a, you know, well, what would you say sort of thing? I was in my 40s, early 40s at this point, and I realized Yeah, I don't know what I would say to my dad, because at this point, right now, today, if I had an hour to talk to my dad, I'd be talking to someone who's young enough to be my son. Yeah. And the moment I realized that, it changed everything, because everything I grew up fantasizing about, all the conversations I imagined having with my dad were always things about, should I drop out of college? You know, should I marry this woman? Should I, you know, all these things. I had to make all these decisions without his wisdom or his guidance. And now I'm to a place where, you know, I don't have kids of my own, but I have friends who have kids. And I tell all my friends, hey, if there's something you don't know how to talk to your kids about, just send them my way. You know, buy me dinner and I will explain the importance of birth control to your 14-year-old, you know. I had to do that. There's so many things I I had to learn the hard way without the guidance of a father. Fortunately, I had a a mom. I have a mom who's still great, you know, and I I had my grandfather and I've had friends, but I didn't have that thing. But that doesn't mean having it would have been any better because I know some people who, you know, their dads are still around and they have crappy relationships with their dad. So there's the danger, right? Because we think about it, you know, we think about, oh, wouldn't it be great if I had my dad? Maybe not. I have a good friend who just lost his dad. He was like, man, I just don't know what to think. And I said, about what? And he said, you know, it's just complex. And I said, your dad was an ass. Your dad was not a good person, period. And he looked at me and he was like, thank you. Because that was the thing. Like he was trying to find the good. And it was like, yeah, your dad, you know, he fathered you. He provided the DNA. But you ain't even seen him in 40 years. He left you and your mom and your sister and you guys were homeless. You want me to go down the list. Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to father of the year, he was never going to win. But, you know, you want to try to find some really cool stuff that he did. We we could do that, you know, because, again, I was around for enough of it. But sometimes you need people just to say that. And that's the thing with me is I don't even have that. I've got, oh, he was good at baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you create the narrative around, oh, he was good at baseball. I don't even know if he was good at baseball. Like, you just say that. Every kid is told they're good at it. Your input matters. If you have thoughts on this episode, check out the show notes to find out how to contact us. We'd love your feedback, suggestions, or just a thumbs up.
You had shared with me before that you did some volunteering at the Dougie Center. The Dougie Center is a resource for grieving children. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you were drawn to that from your own experience. There was a huge part of that, yeah. I was also just dealing with the back-to-back losses of two of my best friends. Barry died in 2011, and then Paul died in 2012. Barry was only a few months older than me, so at the time I think he was 42. Paul was like a year younger than me, so when he died, he would have been probably 40. Barry was very unexpected. Paul, we saw it coming because he was terminally ill. But both were so devastating for me and it continued to be devastating. And so for whatever reason, I just was like, well, maybe if I help young people, you know, get through their devastation, it will help me get through mine. I think it did to a certain extent. But the interesting thing was it didn't help me as much with Barry and Paul as it, it helped me more with my dad. And also my grandmother, because the loss of my grandmother was so incredibly difficult. And there was a few other people that I lost when I was younger. Working with young people really helped me to come to grips with a lot of the baggage that I'm still carrying around and let me know how important it is to not just give voice to how much you love a person or or how great they were, but also some of the negative stuff that you feel around it. There was one young girl that I was working with. She was probably about 14, 15 at the time. She was very angry at her older brother for dying. And all the other counselors were like, what sort of thing would you say to your brother? And everyone was focusing on the positive. You could see it. This girl was not past the anger phase. But because everyone wanted her to say these positive things, she wasn't getting the negative out. And this was purely on instinct. I said to her, I was like, look, kid, you need to get the anger part out. You need to express how absolutely pissed off you are at your brother for dying, even though it wasn't his fault. And then once you've said it and it's out there, you can let it go. While you're holding it inside, it's never going to go anywhere. It's just going to fester inside. And we can't find peace with anything until we figure out how to let go of it. So she did this in in this narrative that she created. She talked about how angry she was. People were shocked by it because this is the sweetest kid. And she emailed me like a year or two later and she said, you know, thank you so much because I needed to let go of that. And and she went on to be a youth counselor. That one-on-one that we did through this program with the Dougie Center and Northwest Documentary, I don't know if I could do that again. I've done it twice now, but I can talk to people and talk about these are some of the things that you can do and the importance of storytelling. We're all just looking to heal from one trauma or another. That's part of what story is there for. If nothing else, to get it out of us. You're not going to be over it, but you're also not going to be carrying it. It's like you've taken it out of your pocket and you've put it on the table. And it's like, okay, well, at least you're not carrying it with you. It's sitting on the table. But then it gets to a point where you can take it off the table. Maybe you can put it in a closet. You forget that it's in the closet for a while. And then something happens and you're looking for something else in that closet. And you go, oh, oh, there it is. (laughs) Here's the reminder. But you know what? I don't have to put this in my pocket anymore. It's sat in this closet. Sometimes it's weeks or months or years. And that process of grief, for me, as I've experienced it, the thing that I've discovered is that the intensity of the grief never diminishes but it does come less frequently. Yeah. It wasn't until I discovered that. That's the only advice I've ever given people about grief and and grieving and dealing with it is we all go through it in our own different ways. The pain that you feel, sometimes you feel it 24-7. Then you get to a point where you're feeling it every day, but you're only feeling it six days a week. And then you feel it five days a week. Then suddenly, oh, well, now it's only two days a week. And then it's once a month. And then maybe it's once a year. It's on the anniversary of whenever what happened. Or it's the song that you hear on the radio, or it's the the silly commercial on TV that reminds you. And then you have a good cry, or you have whatever it is that you have, and you go, okay, I can get through this. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual in Portland, Oregon. This episode was produced and edited by Jack Saturn and me, Sarah Shaul. The music was by Samantha Jensen. Visit us online at griefgratitudegreatness.com. 
You can also follow us on Instagram at Grief Gratitude Great. Subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you like to listen. And leave us a review. Your feedback helps our show and helps us find new listeners. If you have a story of your own that you'd like to share or topics you'd like to hear more about, we'd love to hear from you. Call or text our show at 503-454-6646 or send us a message via the contact link at griefgratitudegreatness.com. Be sure to let your friends know about us and join us next time. We look forward to sharing more conversations with you.